Welcome, everybody. I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. This is a forum on Assembly Bill uh, 5. It's designed to be educational. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not a happy bill for us to talk about, as you all know. Um, the bill is affecting many independent contractor status. For, for most of you in this room, you wouldn't be here if it didn't affect you. My name is John Bly. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Engineering Contractors Association, a local advocacy group up here in Northern California that uh, works with local issues. So this is a little bit out of our comfort zone here with a state issue like that. But uh, we've got some really good speakers here that we'll introduce in a few minutes. But before we get started, I wanted to introduce our partner in crime and our host tonight, Keith Woods with the North Coast Builders Exchange. We're in conjunction. John, I'm Keith Woods. I work here as CEO of the Builders Exchange. I'm the John Bly of the Builders Exchange without the charm and boyish good looks that John has. And I muddle through. Uh, for those who have not been here before, welcome uh, to our training center. Uh, just in brief, uh, we're a contractors association in Sonoma Lake, Mendo, and Napa. We've got around 1,250 members, and we partner up whenever we can with ECA because we are very like-minded on issues, and any time that John asks if we'll partner up on a program like this, we're happy uh, to do so. So welcome here uh, to, to our humble abode. Uh, restrooms are right around the corner there, so if you need them and uh, the food that uh, Mary arranged, thank you, Mary. And uh, we're going to talk about AB, which... Uh, understand it's short for awful bullshit five. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I know you have assembled a great panel, John, so thank you panelists. And uh, I'd love to say enjoy your program, and you can't. We've got to talk about this thing. John, thank you. Nobody well, really says bullshit quite as well as people do. Anyways, thank you, Keith. Um, before we get started, I got a, just a couple of housekeeping items to do. We got a couple of thank yous to do. So, um, our sustaining members are recognized at every one of our events because they allow us to operate, continuing to function. By the way, before we get to the sustaining many members, Mary, wave your hand. Mary does all the hard work back there. I want to thank our business sustaining members, Sound Ideas, Don Mills over there on the camera. Sire Industries, B. Dolan Trucking, Smith Dollar, Attorney in Law, and Moss Adams, CPAs. And I'd also like to also thank our corporate sustaining members, Gelati Construction, RCX General Engineering Contractors, Soylent Company, Northwest General Engineering, and Team Gelati. These guys are recognized in every one of our events that put up money in the five seats. We have a couple of uh, other people that I have to thank, and those are the sponsors for tonight. Jay at r &S, where are you? Please stand up, raise your hand. Thank you very much, Jay. <laughs> Eric and Kim at V. Dolan Trucking. Debbie <laughs> over here at Mag Trucking. Mike, where are you, Ryan? Interwest Insurance Services. Thank you, Joe. They're sponsoring this specific event. Um, you'll see some three by five cards. The idea is if you are intimidated speaking in front of people but you've got something that you want to ask the speakers, at the end you can write your question out. We'll be happy to read it, read it for you and then it's anonymous. Okay? If you, I think this group doesn't really have any particular problem speaking. So the question and answer might be pretty good tonight. We'll see. Um, I also want to take a, just one more thing. I want to, Please welcome and thank our three speakers tonight. They traveled a long way, as did many of you guys. How many from Mendocino County, by the way? We've got one, two, two from Mendo County. Napa County, Solano, we got Hayward, obviously, and then uh, Auburn for Steve Molden coming down here. Anyways, uh, I'm surprised we didn't have more from Mendo with all the fire cleanup that we happened up there and so forth, but uh, the word travels slowly. The, the bullshit hits the fan a little longer up there, it makes it a little longer. Anyways, our three speakers tonight. 
Uh, Stephen Holden is our first speaker, founder of the Holden Law Group in Auburn, California, mostly dealing with labor law issues, and uh, manages both the legal services and the human resource consulting departments of the firm, seasoned in employment claims, member of the California Bar Association, extremely qualified to speak to the legal aspects of Dynamex, AB5, and how it will affect your HR departments. Big HR departments, little HR departments. Little HR departments are single owner operators. Get your own HR department. Individual truckers that have operators, owner operators, and the enforcement of the new law. Please welcome Steve Holden all the way from Harvard Valley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Either way. Uh, right. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. You know I need this? Yeah. Yes. Yes, okay. Um, so I thought I'd be the only one wearing a suit, but I did for two reasons. Well, I have a little bit of time, but two reasons for the suit. Because I'm going to be easily identified as the attorney in the room, right? <laughs> and the other reason is I forgot my belt in the hotel I was in last night. So this kind of covers it more. So if you see me doing this, it's just nervousness because I don't want my pants to fall down. <laughs> um, so I am going to, uh, we've got a variety of different things to go over and so my understanding is I'm going to give you a little bit of history and overview on what's now AB5. Um, there's a game plan. A little history, a little background on the IC law. If I say IC law, I'm talking about the independent contractor. I'm also going to go really fast because I know that we're going to have lots of questions so I'm going to try and blow through this really fast. If there was something and I went too fast, I'd be happy to you know, talk to you guys afterwards or something. Going to review Dynamex, which started the whole thing, then AB5, the new legislation. Going to talk really briefly about why it matters for anybody who hasn't been involved in a class action having to do with any of this stuff. A few recommendations, and then I think we're doing the Q&A after everything, right? Yeah. So let's get into it. So here's the history of it. Um, the independent contractor law developed a uh, long, long time ago, early in the last century, because what happened was there was this notion that if somebody engaged somebody to do work, and they controlled everything about it, all the details of the work, and they were in control of the whole thing, and then that worker went and injured somebody, the worker shouldn't be responsible. It should be the person who hired him to do the work and who maintained the control. So the very first test was, who maintained the control of the details of work? That's how we originally decided independent contractor law. Well, that developed later as we added social welfare legislation. Social welfare legislation, workers' comp, unemployment insurance, disability insurance, all those things. What was happening is they passed those laws wanting protection for workers, social welfare in the case of workers' comp, somebody gets injured, make sure they have health care, replacement wages, etc. Well, they saw that people who classified as independent contractors were getting out of that because the only test was control. And it was fairly easy to just sort of sidestep that in how we set up our arrangements with our IC, with their independent contractors. So what they do is with the courts, added secondary factors to make it not just a test of who was in control of the details of the work, but then these secondary factors, okay? That developed then into the multi-factor test, which we still have today and we'll still apply and we'll talk about that. How many people have heard of the IRS 20-factor test? Have you heard of that? Okay, that's the, that's the original test that the IRS uses, 20 different factors, you look at all those factors, and they either indicate employment or they independent, indicate a legitimate independent contractor relationship. Out of all that, we moved into something called the economic realities test, which stepped back even further to say, oh, we got all these factors, we're going to look at all these factors, but net, net, what's the economic reality of this? Is the IC truly an independent business? or is it really more like a worker who's working for the hiring entity? And so it sort of mushed out to a certain degree the multi-factor test. And then we had developed hybrids because the courts, you got, okay, 20-factor test for the IRS, EDD used a 24-factor test, 
the DFEH used a different factor test, and then the courts would apply them differently. Depending on the fake the case, they might seize on one factor more than another factor. And so we got all these hybrid tests all over the place. So the one positive thing about APC is in some instances the test is a lot easier. So that means less litigation, less uncertainty, which results in costs for attorneys and all that press. Then we got Dynamex last year, April 30th, 2018. Because there had never been a definition, uh, the courts had never looked at, what did it truly mean to employ under the wage orders? And the wage orders are those things that delineate the primary rules for overtime, meal and rest breaks, um, adequate seating, how you can have an alternative schedule, all, all those things that are the wage and hour stuff. They were interpreting what it means to employ. They looked at all these tests that we had before, and more that we haven't even discussed here, and said none of these really work well for us. We don't like these. And because of the social welfare aspect of the laws that are in place, we're going to go outside of California and look to see what other states and other um, countries <coughs> even were doing. And we like this test called the ABC test. And they adopted the ABC test. Three factors, you only look at three factors and almost everybody blew it on the B factor, which I'll talk about in a minute. So, after that, and I think Debbie's gonna talk a lot more about what happened after that for the, um, legislative um, uh, lobbying efforts and to deal with Dynamex before we got AB5. Of course, I'm not gonna talk about any of that, I just know there was a lot of activity, but we ended up with AB5, which was passed and signed by the governor which will take effect January 1, okay? So, just so you've seen it, this is an example of a multi-factor test. There's only 12 factors on this. There are no 12-factor multi-factor uh, tests. I ran out, of, ran out of room on the page. That's only 12 factors. But I put the ones that give you a sense of the kinds of things you look for under the multi-factor test. Um, you know, what's the permanency of the work? Is this a you know, one-time job for three hours and they're gone? Or are they showing up and doing this every day, day after day after day? Um, the this degree of skill that's required in the work that's being done. Is it a low skill job or a high school job? Those are just examples. You look at all those factors, you weigh them out, I should say you, the court does, and decides independent contractor or not, okay? We still are going to be using these, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And when I do, I'll be referring to it as the Borello test. Because if it's not ABC now, it's going to be Borello, which was a case that used a multi-factor test. Okay, so just what we were used to already using today. So Dynamex was um, kind of an easy decision for the Supreme Court, it was delivery drivers. And in that particular case, the reason I put it was filed in 2005 is to give you an idea of how inefficient litigation is and how long it takes for law to develop. It was filed in 2005, the decision was 2018 in the California Supreme Court. So the Dynamex Corporation was involved in litigation for all those years before they actually got a decision in their case. Can you imagine how much attorney's fees were involved in that? Holy crap. Um, so one of the things we're going to talk about later is options for you. And, and, it, and a lot, as for many people, it involves balancing risk. And so if you're thinking, oh, I, want to, I really want to push the envelope with the design of my company, it's great. We should be also talking about what's the long time the risk of that. And if you get involved in litigation, as you, many of you may already know, prohibitively expensive. The one thing about the ABC, or Dynamex, and this ABC test, it was easy for them, to a certain degree, to arrive at the decision that Dynamex should lose and that these were employees and not independent contractors. And the reason for that is because they were employees. And the company decided to convert them to independent contractors. You can't convert employees to independent <coughs> contractors. You will always lose that case. Um, so if you're ever thinking about that, stop, because that is the biggest red flag is a conversion of a group of employees to independent contractors. Um, and there was evidence in the case not only that they did that, 
But the reason they did that was because it would make the company more profitable. Um, so anyways, we got the test. There's the test. The first component is that uh, issue of control, okay? Free, if it's an independent contractor, got to be free from control and direction from the hiring entity. The second factor, the B factor that I put in orange is the one that almost everybody fails and makes it impossible, in many instances, impossible to have anything but an employee, is the person who's doing the work has to be doing something that is outside of the hiring entity's <coughs> usual course of business. So if they're doing what you do, or it's a significant part or component of what you do, they cannot be an independent contractor under the ABC test. That is why this is so disruptive, because B was only one factor you looked at in the multi-factor test. So you could lose on the B factor, but if you were good on a lot of those other factors, you were still solid in terms of having an independent contractor relationship. Okay? But with the ABC test, if you can't show that they're doing something outside of what you do, for instance, I have a law firm, I hire a plumber to come fix the kitchen sink, I'm good. Could I hire anybody to do anything related to legal services or HR consulting services? No chance, because I can't meet the B factor. Okay? Um, and then the, the last factor, the C factor, again, a factor that is part of the multi-factor test, and that is, is the person doing something where they've um, independently established a trade or business for themselves? Okay? But it's the B factor that's the big problem. So, AB5, Debbie's going to talk a lot about how we got to AB5, um, but what we got with AB5 is the California legislature saying, you who we love, we love Dynamex because instantaneously it's going to take thousands of independent contractors and turn them into employees. Why would the state like that? Money, money, money. Um, but even before that, even before we had AB5 and Dynamex, every single agency, government agency in California, that regulates or touches the employment relationship, whether that's EDD, or that is um, the DFEH, the Labor Commission, they all had a preconceived, hardcore bent against independent contract. For two reasons. One, money is part of it. But the day-to-day -day operations people in those agencies, it was more about, and is more about, that paternalistic view that employers are bad and that they are all trying to take advantage of a worker and take, take away all the protections of a worker. And only the government, through those agencies, can protect that poor worker. I mean, dealt with enough of them. Now, not every single person has that, but there is an absolute bias of that paternal nature. If we don't protect, who will? And so, if you're an employer, you are always on the downside of that, okay? And um, what you're on the downside of then, but even more clearly today, is there is a presumption that if somebody is doing work for you, they are an employee. You have the burden of proving they are not. That is very significant. Because usually when somebody sues you, the person who's suing you has the burden to establish that they are correct. The defendant doesn't. The defendant can just sit back and wait to see if the plaintiff can prove their case. In the context of independent contractor relationships with AB5, there is a specific presumption that everybody's an employee, you have to prove otherwise. Okay, that's very significant. Um, so the other thing that AB5 did was it took that ABC test, and which in Dynamex was just applicable to the wage orders, and applied it to everything in the labor code, which then includes workers' compensation, and the uninsurance employment code. So essentially took it and moved it across what I'll call the basic wage and hour stuff and um, workers' comp. Now the thing that's interesting about it is, and while there'll be more developments, they didn't apply it to everything that's employment. So if you're talking about uh, discrimination or harassment under the Fair Employment and Housing Act, 
the ABC test doesn't decide whether somebody's your contractor or their employee. We go back to the multi-factor test in Barretto. Um, so, but for the wage and hour stuff, the ABC test plot applies unless there are, you fall within one of the exceptions. So I think the ABC, or the, excuse me, 85, it's like 13 pages long when I printed it out, something like that, it's fairly long. Um, and in it, the, the application of the ABC test is paragraph one, very short. You get into the exceptions and it goes on and on and on because the definitions for each exception get, can get fairly complicated. I only put some of the most relevant ones for this audience. For instance, <coughs> I'm not going to talk about commercial fishing exemptions because I would have to be, oh. um, So the first would be licensed professionals, attorneys, doctors, accountants, that sort of stuff. It's a little broader than that, but if we're not talking about somebody who might be like that, it's not going to apply. The next is something they call professional services. Okay, that sounds pretty broad, but you can kind of see from the small print that I put in there, very specific things <coughs> for professional services. Uh, if you're a photographer, or if you're a graphic designer, or if you're a barber or manicurist or whatever. So it's not all professional services, it's those specific ones that are listed, and it's kind of a random collection which I assume has something to do with lobbying efforts. Um, the next is something that's called business to business contracting relationship. Okay, now that sounded at first blush when I saw that, I'm like, okay, this, this is good. This, this is one where the lobbyists kind of won over the legislature, got this in there because so many of the things that you have or my clients have had as contracting relationships sound like a business to business contracting relationship. Well, the problem with this definition is when you dig into it, the person who's doing the work has to be doing work that is directly for the hiring entity, not the hiring entity's clients. And that looks a hell of a lot like the B factor under the ABC test. But the words are different, so whether it will turn out to be just like the B factor under ABC, I don't know, but it certainly limits those situations where you'd be able to say, oh, I'm good, because I got this business-to-business -business contracting relationship, okay? So there are a number of components for that, but the one that's going to trip up a lot is the person doing the work cannot be doing the work with the, directly to the clients of the hiring entity. They have to be doing the work for the hiring entity, okay? Um, uh, then construction. So, you know, talking bad news, bad news, but a lot of people here are construction, right? That's, yes. All right. So I think there's actually, as much as I'm sort of negative on all this whole thing, because of the upheaval means there's going to be uncertainty, uncertainty, bad for business, costly, gets attorneys involved, that always is bad, okay? Certainty is good. We're going to have a lot of uncertainty. But one of the positives in this is, in construction, if you are dealing with a traditional general contractor, subcontractor relationship, or subcontractor, subcontractor relationship, there's an exemption <coughs> in the law from the ABC test, and instead, you'll be governed by Borello, the multi-factor test. The same way we would have judged your independent contractor relationships before Dynamex and before 85. So it's actually kind of decent news. The bad news in contracting, and you guys have probably already addressed this, is the whole laws that were passed before this, that for wage and hour stuff, if you're in a higher level of contractor, you're responsible for all sub-level subcontractors under you in terms of their wage payment and compliance with wage and hour law. Um, so, and I won't get into that and how you deal with all that, but that's probably more problematic than that because of this exception for the Then there's a very narrow one for construction trucking services. Um, specific trucks over 2,600 gross weight, um, and it, it sun, sunlight? sunsets in, at the end of 2021. So 
26,000. Thank you. Um, and so you probably, it would probably would not be wise to bank on building your business model around it because it's a temporary one anyways. And there's a, more requirements to it, but if you're in that, um, you know, it'd be worth looking at whether you're okay for a while. And then uh, referral agencies, there's one for referral agencies. And like the business to business, it sounded like, oh, this might work for like brokers or other business arrangements that you might have. Once again, though, they specifically define what a referral agency is, and it goes back to referring, marketing, graphic design, uh, grant writers, these specific things that aren't going to help anybody in this room. So, um, so for most, the exceptions are not going to be fantastic, although if you're just straight construction and you're a general contractor, subcontractor, or you're a subcontractor who subs out your work, the good news is you're going to be under the Borello standard. Uh, and so it's kind of the same way uh, applied in the past. Uh, no way you can say no big deal. Um, it, has anybody, uh, that's, I'm not going to ask that question, that was horrible. Um, has anybody, has people heard about wage and hour class actions in California? Has anybody gotten close enough to, to really see what they're like? Know anybody who's had to go through one or some a few shaky <coughs> uh, It is, for those who haven't, um, my job is to, to say, oh my God, you've got to wake up. Because if it hasn't happened to you, it, I, so many clients, never happened to them, never have a lawsuit, never have an issue. Been doing this for 40 years. Everybody in the industry does it. And then the probably the second conversation we're having is, look, I'm an employment expert. I can we can defend. I can tell you what the law is. We can develop strategies. But it but you need to be talking to a bankruptcy attorney right now because I don't know anything about protecting your assets. And if if we if this goes even slightly south, everything's at risk. And I'll give you an example why. This is a very, very quick example that I put together on a misclassification issue. Misclassification issues are the worst. <clears throat> misclassification issues, you make somebody an independent contractor, the court ultimately says they're an employee. Why is that the worst? Because by definition, you haven't done anything you're supposed to do for an employee because you were treating them as an independent contractor. You haven't paid any taxes. You haven't given pay stubs. You haven't given them overtime. You haven't given them meal and rest. I mean, on and on and on. By definition, you violated everything if you misclassified. That's why the plaintiff's attorneys are chomping at the bit for this, because now it's going to be easy to find misclassification. And when they do, you violated everything. And the thing that's great about violating everything if you're a plaintiff's attorney, everything comes with its own penalties. And you get to put the penalties in many instances on top of each other. It's what we call <coughs> penalty stacking. It's the biggest fight that's going on between the people in my world and the people that represent employees and bring wage and hour class actions. So here's an example, very quick one. It assumes that we had somebody we were paying 25 bucks an hour, okay? And we misclassified them. If we did, we're going to have $4,000 worth of liability under 226. We're going to have $47,000, $47,800 in unpaid overtime and PAGA penalties, okay? And that is assuming that the person alleges that they just worked nine hours a day, okay? Nine hours a day was a typical thing. Obviously, it gets way worse because they typically say 10, 12 hours a day, and they can say anything they want because it's your burden to prove they worked less, okay? The burden of proof is on you, not them. So on and on and on, these are just some. You'll see at the bottom I said other numerous ones. Again, ran out of page on the, to put more of them. You could stack more. But here's an example for a single employee. I'm at $200,000. That does not include the fact that you will automatically pay all of their attorney's fees. If they get $1, you pay all of their attorney's fees. And you have to pay somebody like me. So you pro if the case went on for three years, <coughs> Uh, that's going to be $500,000 plus. Easy. Every time. 
That's a one employee. What if you had 200? You see the, how the problem is? That's why almost always the second conversation I'm having with the client after we start to put together what we need to defend these cases is you need to talk to a bankruptcy attorney because they know how to protect your assets. They know the strategies that you might employ to best protect yourself because the dollars get so big, so fast, over the smallest of the bank. Okay, so um, hopefully, uh, I, I just, I've seen it so many times with clients who they've never had any exposure to this and it is w way worse than a slap in the face to wake up one day and say, you know what, you're probably gonna lose your business in this situation. Now, do most lose their business? No, they don't. Why don't they? Because the plaintiff's attorney doesn't want you to file bankruptcy. Because if you file bankruptcy, they get nothing. So we're usually making a deal, but they're very costly deals. Um, all right, so recommendations, number one, uh, very carefully analyze if you have anybody that you're classifying as an independent contractor in 1099, you got to look at those very closely now because it's not only the government agencies that are looking, as I said, the incentivized plaintiff's attorneys are looking because they get their attorney's fees automatically. Even if they don't build up a big case with big dollars, they get their attorney's fees automatically. Um, so, um, step two with this, many of you are going to have to look and start thinking about structural operational changes, new ways of doing business. I'm going to give you one example. This goes way back, um, but um, I had a client who um, had employees, had independent contractors, but he also had this very unique franchise model. And because he had a franchise model, he essentially we were able to defend an EDD audit where they were trying to get a million bucks from from misclassification. We said, no, here's, here's the franchise law on this thing. Everything they're doing is in accordance with franchise law, and they're required to do it under franchise law, and EDD had to back down off of that. Now, that may not work for everybody, but it's just an example of a creative new way of doing business, so that it could actually be a positive. One positive that comes out of all this is you're going to be looking at new creative ways to do business, possibly, that might ultimately be better. Um, that's me trying to be optimistic. Most of it is shit. Um, <laughs> if you do enter in the infinite contract relationship, then you definitely want to make sure you have a written agreement. Okay, that's the first place the court is going to go to. And then and that it is well written and it essentially gives you the best protection you can have in an agreement. But you have to remember having that agreement doesn't end you the court still goes through the multi-factor test. So it's really what you're actually doing. And the other thing that a lot of clients don't know is your intention and the intention of the person who's wanting to be the independent contractor or desire, I should say, it doesn't matter. You don't have freedom of contract to just say, hey, yeah, let's do this. You good with it? I'm good with it? Yeah. And then you're good? No, it doesn't work that way. Um, so, and then the last um, is that uh, if you are going to be converting, because you go, look, these people are clearly not going to meet the ABC test, or they don't meet the Borello multi-factor test, I need to make them employees, then you want to be strategic about how you communicate that. Because you clearly don't want to say, well, you know, I've been misclassifying you guys for the last 15 <coughs> years. And, I mean, don't go talk to any plaintiff's attorney about how much money you can get out of us for that. Um, so you. You want to have a strategic way to communicate that with the independent contractor as you move them into it. And generally, that means um, some window dressing of some other changes that you're doing in your organization and business so it all gets packaged up to something that makes the switch from independent contractor to employee less obvious and less that's it. So, um, well, I think we're going to do all the questions at the end, right? Yeah. So, yes, but after. I think we should do all the questions at the end because you guys will need answers. If you've got yeah, one, I would say if there's a couple specific. If you've got a couple specific to the legal stuff that Steve has prepared, let's pop them out there, guys. Yeah.
Hi, I'm a logo player. I'm Lisa McCarthy Company. I got my own authority. Why can't I sign a contract as an all entity contract in the value? Um, well, I would say you're going to have under the ABC test, oh, sorry, under the ABC test, if it's a trucking company, what's the usual course of their business? Delivering stuff in a truck. Yes. What are you doing? Delivering in a truck. You just failed, you failed the B test. So under that, you can't you can't be a contractor. Um, go to AB5, and we say, well, it's the business to business contracting relationship. Some of those other things you talked about in terms of having your own authority, your own equipment, and all the rest of that, those are going to be factors that are in AB5. But then we get to that factor that says you have to be providing your services directly to the company that is engaging you, not to the customers. I honestly don't know how that's going to turn out because if you're, you, I, everybody in here is probably going, well, he is. He's delivering stuff for the company, right? Um, the other argument to that is, yeah, you're delivering it directly to their clients. You're doing what they would do. How that litigation is going to turn out, I don't know. But my concern is, it looks so much like the B factor that I think it's going to be a problem. Thank you. As a, as a broker, okay, instructor, you supply another contract, contractor with an independent owner operator, and have him will customer can they then in turn slip in five bucks yeah. Did everybody hear that? So if you're a broker and you're putting people together and you get split five bucks, well, hopefully you get split more than five bucks. Uh, if you, you know, how's that going to work? Uh, the answer to that is going to be very uh, individual and specific. But what you're talking about now is how can you structure your business to do it in a way that doesn't make those people who are drivers your employees? And do I think it's possible? Yeah, I think it's possible. I think you'd want to put a lot of uh, not only window dressing, because window dressing attorneys can kind of get behind. So part of the hard part of this is you may have to make some structural changes that you really don't want to make. But could you say, look, I'm in the business of just putting people together. I never deliver anything. I never have anything to do with the actual movement of goods in transit or something. And I'm a matchmaker. I could see a way of possibly doing that in the brokering industry. But again, you're going to want to look at it very carefully. And if you're doing some things that look a little bit more like you're part of the transportation, we're going to do some things that push it the other way. Yeah. Uh, yes. I have a question. An example of the example of what you said, you know, attorneys don't want to follow up because we're going to get some money on and now what I've also heard that most of the labor issues or claims, they can go after the officer's personal assets. Not only is the company assets, but the corporation, let's say you're corporate. If you can file bankruptcy, you still go after the company file bankruptcy, you go after your personal assets. Uh, so he was asking a question of, uh, if we're talking about labor issues, I have a corporation, are my personal assets at risk or just the corporation? The answer to that is yes, your personal assets are at risk. Does that mean you are always going to lose them? No, but that, again, I'm not a bankruptcy attorney, so that's why immediately I get an expert in who knows how to protect you and your corporation to the full ex extent because it's only by using that level of expertise that you're truly going to protect yourself in those situations when we know that there's this guaranteed exposure out there. I mean, I can tell you, it's strict liability, so I could say, well, we didn't intend, or it was just a mistake. None of that matters. It, it's either you do it 100% right, or it's wrong, and you're liable. Can I, as an escort, um, have the Darcy S Corp, who is an employee of his own S Corp, and it passed the ABC rule and the other one that you think is a little more tricky. So it's contractually S Corp to S Corp, S Corp Darcy 
is an employee of his escort. He owns his truck. He asks me as an additional insured. Window dressing, do I need to do anything more? Yes. Because uh, he's more likely going to be viewed as your employee. This, the fact that he's a corp doesn't. To under now under the old tests, it's a, it is a relevant factor to look at, um, and we could push your relationship as you already described. You're pushing those factors in a way that makes him more independent and less like an employee. Fantastic. Um, but with the B factor under ABC, it just doesn't matter because you're in the trucking business. That's what your usual course of business is. Put stand up and be aggressive. Okay. Um, what about like a, a freight logistics company, like an LTS? So they basically are just a liaison between the trucker and the company, but the company, the shipper, pays the logistician and then they pay the trucking company. We don't have trucking services of our own. Right. Can we still do that? You don't have trucking services. Now I'm pretending to be the evil plaintiff attorney. <laughs> okay, you don't. What do you mean you don't have trucking services of your own? What about those employees that you are driving the trucks? No, our company our, doesn't drive the trucks. Oh, you. I know, but you hire those employees that drive the trucks. No, oh, I know you don't call them employees. Right. So I'm being a, a, a little bit facetious, but. Um, there's an example where you are likely going to have to, if you want to escape this and you want to stick with contracting, you're likely going to have to make more significant adjustments to your business model than just currently what you're doing. Because it would be very easy for me, if I was a plaintiff's attorney, to convince a court that you absolutely, what is your business? Moving freight. Yes, you don't get in the truck and move it, but your business is moving freight. Going back to over here, I'm pushing it to a say, I don't know, all I do is match make. Now you're saying all I do is match make too, and what I'm saying is you may have to make structural changes to get far enough into some other line of business where you'd be comfortable saying a plaintiff's attorney couldn't turn this around and say, oh bullshit, you're just moving freight. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, and and it, it will be get very trucks. factually specific for all of you when you start to look at what you do, what your relationships are, how you want them to be. There's not going to be a one size fits all kind of thing. Uh, just to uh, stay on what she said, <coughs> excuse me, I'm also a licensed contractor. Would that have any bearing on uh, corporation to corporation? No. Not under the ABC test. Because we get back to, is it part of the usual course of business? Yes or no? The general contractor does a lot of different things for a lot of hats. So, but again, all I do is drive the truck. So. Um, should we pass some of this on? So we, I, I think we're fine for time. I just got to ask the other two speakers how much presentation uh, you guys need. Because I want to make sure we don't work. You guys. Yeah. Debbie, you need about 15 no. minutes to present or so. You need about 10. We're, we're fine with a couple more questions. You guys want to keep going with the legal questions? Yeah. And uh, this thing's real touchy. You're good with the mic. You keep it about four or five inches away. Otherwise, we get. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. How is it going to be policed? How is it going to be policed? Right. Right. Um, well, there is. Um, one of the bills that was passed this year was an expansion of the task force that has already existed to fight what's called the underground economy. Has anybody heard of that? Mm -hmm. So there's this presumption in California, again, all employers are evil, trying to take advantage of workers, not pay them, uh, not give them any protections. You don't care about the people that work for you. You're evil. So going back a number of years, there were task forces that were created specifically to target certain industries where there was more examples of people that were violating labor laws. 
And the way they did that was they took people from the Labor Commissioner's Office, people from the DFEH, people from EDD, and people from um, the Unemployment Insurance Board and Workers' Comp, and they put them together and created these police forces that are task force. Well, they just expanded it again this year with legislation and gave them more money to the task force. So the one way it's going to happen is there are these task force in the California government that are looking for industries and businesses that are violating the law and misclassification. And uh, so you could get audited one, one way. Um, the other and probably more likely way is your a plaintiff's attorney is going to get a hold of one of your employees. So a number of years ago when this all started, there was a firm in San Diego that started the whole thing. It had nothing to do with the law. They hired just brilliant marketers to figure out how do we target unhappy employees. And through sophisticated marketing techniques, which include social media now, they hone in on unhappy employees. And they say to the unhappy employee, Does you, are you treated fairly or treated with respect? Do you feel like you get the wages that you deserve for the hard work that you do? Do you like your boss? And they treat you? And that's the, those are the questions. And they are targeting to people that they're much more likely to say, no, 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 I hate my boss. Okay, that's the hook. They get them in. They get a records request. The records requests are not to look for fairness or how they're treated. They're looked at to look at the payroll records and look for wage and hour violations because you can see it right on the records. And if it's not right on the records, if you've been doing it for three weeks, you can tell uh, behind what's behind the records from what the records look like. So I can look at your records and I can tell you some of the violations you have without even ask, talking to you because I know based upon the way the records are. Once they get those, done. Strict liability. They got an employee who's signed up as an employee. They've got your records that show that there's a wage and hour violation. They dig a little deeper to add on top of that. And then it's just a multiplier on how many employees you have. Can an employer protect himself or herself by having that employee sign a timesheet that says, I'm happy, they didn't mistreat me, I got my break, I did all this stuff. They did everything right. It gives at least some ammunition to the defense attorney. Yeah, did everybody hear that? Can you protect yourself, and can you protect yourself by having the employee acknowledge that everything was done correctly? Yes, and you absolutely should be doing that. Unfortunately, that isn't even enough. If you want to insulate yourself, and you could insulate yourself virtually from wage and hour claims, the problem is it is going to be administratively burdensome and costly for you to do that. Because at a minimum, you want acknowledgement of time cards. And I'll give you the language to put it at the bottom of the time card. I won't charge you any for it. Slap it at the bottom of the time card. You should be doing that today. But will that insulate you fully? No. Because then what you have to do is you have to monitor those time cards and periodically check that the people are actually doing what you want them to do under your policies. And they understand it. And they understand. So it also starts with training on wage and hour stuff. So if I have a whole checklist of how you could insulate yourself, which is we could talk for three hours on that. Um, but the, and you can do it, but you have to be committed to there's a much more administration that's involved and therefore cost to your business to go through all those hoops to insulate yourself. That type sheet had a lot of uh, no, not necessarily, and and so typically, if you're you're talking about like a, a, a DOT logbook, I would not want that to be my time records because that creates a whole bunch of problems. So we would want, ideally, you'd want both, and they would look different. I just want to be very clear on something. Um, you know, so I said more. <laughs> <laughs>
So I'm your employees are driving their trucks? No, my employees are driving my trucks. Right. Your employees are driving their trucks. Right. And I go to that company then and hire their, their, their trucks. Do you be a risk of all those drivers being classified as your employees? So now, but yeah, absolutely. So here's why they would end up being your employees. Let's say that company that you contract with, they're, they don't run as good a business as you do, and they really don't have assets, and oh, by the way, they missed payroll a few times, and oh, they didn't pay their workers' comp insurance. That comes to light later. Now, all of a sudden, you are the employer. That, that's the risk of it. Now, if you contract with somebody who you know runs a type shift, they're very financially liable, they follow the rules, they treat those people as employees and they're following all the rules, your exposure in that situation is virtually nil because there's, there's no violations, right? So developing a strong relationship with, I should say, developing a contracting relationship with a business that you know is strong in doing it well is one of the insulating factors. Because you go back to, if you're in the construction industry, like I said, you are liable for all levels of contractors that are below you in the contracting chain. The only way to protect yourself is to either, one, develop relationships with subcontractors who you know are doing it right and who are very financially viable or have the backup of bonds or insurance to create that. Um, or you've got to monitor everything they're doing. Let's go two more questions and we'll go to our speakers. In the recent Western <clears throat> Trucking Association magazine, on the very front cover is this article. And it addresses, it talks about this. And what it, what it says in there, the one company that it refers to is FedEx. Now FedEx, of course, we all know the giant is right down the street from me. Hundreds and hundreds of trucks, thousands of trucks, lots of them working within the state of California. They have a, a vision in there. If their truck is red and blue, it's company truck. All of the ones that are green on their door, those are owner ops, and they're part of different groups. In that article, it says, we only hire incorporated companies. Now, what Eric is addressing is that same thing. If, you, if, if I hire Eric's company to work with Kalon, it means that he's running all the stuff just the way you said, a tight ship. And that's what they are doing at FedEx. Now, if it's different than that, it's going to hit tens of thousands of people because FedEx is going to get hit and a lot of other companies that have pullers all over. Um, I hear you, and I can understand where you're coming from. FedEx has been sued hundreds of times, and they paid out many, many millions of dollars on these issues. Well, they don't promote that. They're not fl flying the flag about that. They get sued as much as anybody does. Um, so the idea that just because FedEx is doing it, it's okay, uh, the, all the giants have gotten hit with wage and hour class actions. Walmart, FedEx, you name them, it, all of them. So it's, it, do, I, it's, and it's hard because you say, well, wait a minute, FedEx isn't going to be doing something that would get them in. They do it all the time. And so for them, they may be big enough that they just go, hey, it, we, we can look at the dollars, and if we continue to pay these things and we pay the attorneys, we still net out ahead. But most of us aren't FedEx, and we're not, we're not working with those kinds of scales of economy. Um, but it is not true to say that because FedEx hires uh, incorporators or that's part of their... Yeah, I'm sure they're doing things to minimize that, but I know for a fact they've been sued many, many times for wage and hour violations, and they've lost some big ones, and most of them get settled like anything else. Thank you for your answer. Yeah, go, one more, then we'll, then we'll go on to Debbie. So a, a broker hires a guy who has his own truck and has to consider him and pay him as an employee. What happens to the cost of his truck? What happens to his truck? How is he going to maintain his truck? If I am only paying him as an employee. So uh, AB5 actually addresses that. and. Um, 
essentially, if he's an employee, you have to pay his expenses. Under Labor Code Section 2802, you're liable not only for payroll taxes, workers' comp, and all the rest of that. If he has business expenses, <laughs> the truck is a business expense. So, but, uh, and so AB 5 specifically says that, hey, you can do that. You can, you can, it says you can hire somebody and use their equipment. You just have to reimburse them for the actual cost of the equipment. That is one of the areas where, again, when we talked about restructuring creative business solutions, that may be an area where you could kind of work with that in your relationship with somebody. You treat them as an employee, you pay minimum wage, you have workers comp, you do all those things, you follow all that, but maybe the adjustment to make it work more closely to the way you wanted it to work in the past is how you go about reimbursing for the cost of the truck. Well, that, it says reasonable expenses. Yep. So reasonable is pretty... So your motor goes up this month? I mean, that's reasonable. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. What about he's an independent guy? They said he's your employer now, or your employee. But you're a little bit slow, you don't have enough work for him, so he's going to go over to the other guy and make the, the deal. Now he's not working for you, now he's going to go work for Jim. And he gets hurt. And he says, well, it's on your workers' comp. And he says, hey, no, it's on her workers' comp. Who's worker's comp is it going? Yeah. Mike, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Mike is going to answer that question. Exactly. Uh, but that, we, 85 kind of addresses that as well and essentially says, hey, there's nothing that ever prevented a person from being an employee of more than one employer, and that happens all the time. And they're in workers' comp. There are, you know, the question then becomes of were you injured doing work for company A or company B? And there may be a fight over that, but ultimately there's a way to ferret that out. And then for unemployment, it just gets spread across everybody. Yeah. Hey John, back to the cost. You know, when one of my employees goes to see a client. I don't know what the IRS number is now, 155 cents a mile. The trucking industry is probably going to have to figure out what it costs to run a certain type of truck, and they're going to have to get paid their wages plus that amount of mileage. If that's, I mean, that's what I think the government would say. Okay. If you figure out, and then if they blow the engine, if it's three dollars a mile or whatever it is, or if it's a dollar a mile. It's on them, just like if my engine blows and I'm driving down the road for my. It's going to get muddy, and there's going to be a couple of test cases at the front that everybody will follow afterwards, and even then they'll get challenged. So it'll stay muddy for years and years because you got some really smart people that are on our side. And I, I can't express to you how thankful we are that you were able to come, Stephen. This is really invaluable. Think about some of the long-range contracts, Ken, that we used to have to bid that would last two and three years. And you guys too as well, Mike, <coughs> with hauling involved. Anybody want to change their numbers for some spring work that's out there right now? I mean, this is unfreaking believable wow. what the costs are going to go to to haul in California. And I don't think that the economics of this were looked at by any of our electives, but this is a nice segue into legislation. And our legislative expert is Debbie Ferrari, <laughs> operations manager for Mag Trucking, been in the industry since 1982. She's been absolutely immersed in AB5 and Dynamex. She can talk about this because she is a broker, and uh, she's going to speak your language if you're a trucker. Debbie? Hi. Hi. Um, I did prepare. I typed out ahead because I could be all over the map. And as I get older, it's a little harder to keep my thoughts collected. So I do have prepared words, but I would like to address a few of the things that were talked about here. Um, Basically, where do I start? I'll say that, um, as mentioned, I've been immersed in this for the last year and a half. I've been in Sacramento many times. I've had my ear to the ground, so I, could, I can answer almost any question. 
but I am not a lawyer. <laughs> but I will say this, in, in my view, um, first of all, um, AB5 was actually clarified in terms of, and again, if I don't, you know, if you want to correct me, go ahead, but um, AB5 was actually clarified in terms of trucking when the bill went in and when the bill got finalized. So the uh, ABC test was, was it, what is it was, but in the end, the last committee it went through, which was appropriations, at that point, final adjustments were made, and there was a final adjustment made to the trucking industry. So it isn't just the straight ABC anymore, the way I view it. And we have talked to several contractors about it, and it is confusing, and they have basically said um, so far that there's no real way to get, a, get out of it. It's just, um, try to mitigate your liability temporarily, and that's There's why no I'm here to talk about to get her, get uh, going out. forward. But it was <coughs> it was clarified and, re and replaced. Basically, what they've said when it comes to trucking, if you're an owner-operator, you're only allowed to work for one type of entity, and that would be a licensed construction contractor for his own work, doing work that requires a licensed construction contractor. That's what it says. It says you are not allowed to work for any broker. You are not allowed to work for any intermediary. And in essence, it says you're not really not allowed to work for anyone except a licensed construction contractor on his work, period. So logistics is off the table. Um, basically, um, again, I've got my notes scattered all over until I roll into the legislation thing, but basically we're looking at a two-track situation here. One is how do we get by for the next year while we also actively try to get legislation to turn this thing around. Um, you asked how it was going to be policed. I'll, I'll give you some ideas. First of all, if you issue 1099s, that's an obvious way that you're an immediate target. Anyone you give a 1099 to, you know, that's it. Okay, secondly, any public works project is going to be policing this. Any and every public works project, it's going to be a, become a part, it's going to become a requirement that you comply with AB5. Secondly, any uh, project that has a project labor agreement, which those are growing like wildfire, I don't know about in Santa Rosa, but in Alameda County, more and more public works have project labor agreements, and even private works are having project labor agreements. If the owner of the project, whether it be public or private, enters into a project labor agreement, that means you have to comply with the union. The union's going to be policing what you're doing and making sure you're following the rule. Certified payroll is going to police this situation. So um, in terms of being able to hide, if you're on a private project that doesn't have a project labor agreement and the union has no clue who you are and they don't notice you on the road and you never issue 1099s, you're still not in compliance, maybe you would um, be able to escape it for a little while. So, let's see. The union's not going to rest until everyone is an employee and everyone is, um, is uh, organized by the union. So this is just a first step. Um, everybody's saying, what about employee this, employee that? This is only step one. The reason for the bill is that the union wants everybody organized. That's the next step. No matter what you do, in the end, the union will never rest until everyone's an employee and everyone's organized unless this law gets turned around. This AB5 is a union-sponsored bill. The bill, the author is Lorena Gonzalez, who used to work for the union. The union sponsored the bill. The union stood up and said publicly, this is our bill. The union is the one who decided who would get an exemption and who would not. 
So if you ask for an exemption and you're a um, Avon salesman, you went to the author, Lorena Gonzalez, asking for an exemption. She goes over to the union, asks the union, is it okay if Avon has an exemption? If the union says yes, then Avon gets their exemption. If the union says no, they don't. The union said no to trucking. They said no to all trucking. Originally, they were really just mostly after port truckers. There's a huge thing in Southern California, a huge number of port truckers that they really want to organize, and plenty of misclassification. Then they saw an opportunity to try to grab all, all truckers, and they don't want to let go of the, the opportunity. The operators and the laborers and the other unions couldn't care less about trucking. They've been told from up above, you honor what the Teamsters say. And the Teamsters have said, we don't want to let go of trucking, therefore, and, and they've said behind the scenes, I'm going to be honest and straight up, I'm, I'm telling the truth, I'm not going to be afraid to speak up. The union has said, and I'm not saying the union's all bad, they're great for operators, they're great for uh, laborers, they're great in many instances, but, you know, it's, they, their ship has sailed in, in at least certain types of trucking, and they want to get back in there, and they don't care about that the owner-operator would lose money. We've sat down with the union, we've sat down with the author, we had owner-operators, we sat down with many members, and they've said behind the scenes, look, we're, we're interested in organizing people. That's our concern. So when our, and I'll tell you in a minute, kind of our carve out, because it's certainly not for all trucking, it's only for certain truckers that meet. Um, we made our points, we were very clear about it, and in the end, some lobbyists that we worked with talked to the union behind the scenes about our points and the union literally said, um, look, we need a lot more members. So unless you can help us get a lot more members, we're not gonna make a deal with you. It's as simple as that. So um, with that, let's see. The company to company, um, there's a question, uh, we were working with Double D, we've posed a question to a very friendly assembly member. Some of these questions, we can ask some of these questions. Um, we've sent in a question to Ledge Council, which is the lawyers that work with the assembly and Senate, and that's one of the questions we sent. Can company A hire company B? Um, I tend to agree with um, what the gentleman is saying in terms of exactly what he said. You can hire another company if you know they're only using their own employees, period. And you know they're also treating their employees correctly, but there's nothing that says that right now. So we're trying to get that um, the, you know, clarified a little. The, um, the author and the union would rather, the author and the union, and I might have this in my little speech here, um, they want brokers and intermediators intermediaries. Actually, they want us out of business and they've said so publicly. They would rather, owner-operator, what they would rather, they made a little provision that owner-operators can work direct for a contractor, but they really don't want that. That was just incidental protection. What they really want is for the contractor, you know, to realize that's too difficult or for the intermediary and broker go out of business, then the contractor would ultimately just procure his own fleet and have his own employees because they would much rather organize a healthy contractor that's already a member of the union. So their end game, if they have everything they want, is for the contractor to just have his own fleet of employees. They don't, un I should say, I would say they don't understand, but I think it's more that they don't care that, in, that the contractor's employees, uh, their contractor's needs vary and fluctuate so greatly that's why they can't hang on to a fleet of trucks. That's a whole reason they depend on brokers. So with that, with this two-track system of um, how are we going to limp by with the union watching our every move, and especially on, on public jobs, we'll be challenged at every moment, especially if you're going to work on any public works. With that, um, I've been lobbying you know, as hard as I can. Our team is now growing exponentially, hopefully including you guys, other people. Now they're starting to learn. Nobody told us about AB5. Um, we've had to learn it through our lawyers or through others. 
but we made a lot of noise. We have made some progress, and um, so I'm gonna really I'm looking forward to um, you know yes, do what you can to protect yourself, but let's get this thing changed. And so I'm going to roll into my written words, which is, first of all, I'd like to thank, I want to thank John Bly and NCECA for, for inviting me. And I want to say it's very meaningful to me that our, and our company, um, that you reach out to us. So, um, AB5 in its current form will not work in our sector and it will not last. There will be many changes over the years, so any attempt to make drastic change to one's business model would be risky. It's an attempt to force an unnatural change on our sector that has clear indication of detrimental result, and from a business standpoint, that's a recipe for failure. Improvements related to classification are good within our own sector and bending of rules is not acceptable. However, in general, our sector complies with the California Vehicle Code in terms of classification, whereas many members of other sectors of trucking do not. Every example raised by supporters of AB5 without exception failed to meet current vehicle code which describes what an, owner, what an owner operator is. One main section of that is vehicle code 34624. Our sector meets all of the vehicle codes. Every reason that we have given our case, which is steeped in hard facts and evidence, has been answered with a cursory anecdotal response by supporters of AB5. That's why we will win eventually. We just have not been loud enough. We've not done enough to stand up for our own freedom and our own rights. It's important for people to remember truckers are people too. In a nutshell, the sector I'm representing consists of owner operators and those that use them that follow certain criteria. The main criteria are two key factors that allow for independence. One, the owner operator being utilized purchased the truck without help from a hiring entity. Two, the owner operator has his own DMV motor carrier permit and he needs to follow all the laws that come along with that as does the hiring entity. So that's in our proposed legislation. Um, this allows the uh, owner-operator freedom of choice. Again, examples laid out by supporters of AB5 did not need this. An owner-operator can change his mind and decide to work for someone else as an employee instead. And that's going to be driving the employer's truck, not his own truck. I mean. Everybody can do what they want, but it, in, in my, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I would never consider hiring someone as an employee in their own truck because um, somebody's going to lose and it's probably going to be both of you. So an owner-operator has the right to be an employee instead. In my view, that's going to be driving my truck. So he would have to sell his truck or I would have to buy his truck now he's going to be an employee just like all the rest of our employees. You can't just treat employees differently. He's either an employee making the same as the rest of you, the employees driving your truck, or he's not. There's no intermediate. Someone's going to get in big trouble you start trying to do that. So that's a personal choice, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't make sense. It's liability. It would hurt both parties. So it's about choice. We have the right of we have the right of choice if we've earned it. We're not Uber and Lyft driving our own cars. We earned it when we invested in the equipment and the permits on our own. So as you know, we truckers have faced many difficult hurdles over the years. The most recent um, was that we needed to invest in clean air trucks or we would go out of business. 
We just invested in the new trucks per state regulation, and now the state says we aren't allowed to be an independent owner-operator or utilize services of one. Some people have grants that would be in default. Um, it's ludicrous for the state to force an investment and then force the person out of business. It's time to speak up. The current law related to construction does not help truckers by any means. It's a carve-out for construction firms, which is good. No, no problem with the construction firm having a carve-out. That's good. But the problem is they threw in trucker restrictions that were unrelated, and then they called it a trucker fix, which really confuses people. In any case, okay, so in any case, even the carve-out for the contractors, where they're allowed to hire an owner-operator rep, even that sunsets in two years. So that alone tells you that AB5 is temporarily when it, when it's rela as related to trucking. Uh, two years is enough time to go broke, and at the same time it passes quickly. So if you make a drastic change within your company, thinking that you're going to be bulletproof, all of a sudden two and three years, everything's changed. So that's, that's one thing that makes this tough. Uh, another potential change to consider is, um, is that uh, there is a pending lawsuit by CTA based on federal uh, preemption. Many people say that that lawsuit will succeed eventually. So when, when that lawsuit eventually succeeds, things are going to go back to the way they were. And again, if you've made too drastic of a change, you try to raise your weight, rates way up, all of a sudden there's going to be a drop. The problem with waiting on that lawsuit is that there's not a guarantee, it probably would go to the U.S. Supreme Court, this thing is going to take years. So um, it's ridiculous to think that suddenly it'd be virtually illegal to be an owner-operator and that miraculously everyone will become an employee. Firms from out of state can do what they want while we pay the price. Agriculture wouldn't be hauled properly. A freedom grab like nobody's business. Clean air investments out the window. And that's why common sense tells you that this will not last. If you understand trucking and you understand business, we're ordinary citizens, so the term that's politics certainly don't work with me. Um, so what do we do? We fight because it's about what's ethical. We fight to preserve our freedom. But to be practical, most of all, we, we fight because this is going to change sooner or later. And the longer we wait, if we sit by, the more harm will come of it for not only truckers, but all of those that are affiliated with trucking, both directly or indirectly. So we need to get this change over with ASAP. In business, it's smart to be proactive, not reactive. So I've, I've given out handouts of different things that both contractors and owner-operators can do um, to help, that each person can do to help this battle. If enough people fight the battle, and especially if we can get contractors helping, we will, we will prevail. Um, Many trucking firms, a.k.a. brokers of all sizes, perform a valuable service provided that they follow the vehicle code. We bid projects, guarantee performance, provide comprehensive insurance, help with acquiring materials and dump sites. If we hire an owner-operator, we make sure he has a valid motor carrier permit at all times. The hiring entity is violating the vehicle code if the owner-operator is found to have a suspended or expired permit. Whoever hires them is responsible for that. The legislature does not understand the true value of a responsible trucking broker. The spokesperson on behalf of AB5 publicly stated <coughs> on the Senate floor that AB5 is designed to put brokers out of business. The truth needs to be explained to them by someone other than just truckers. But it's up to truckers to get involved because whether you feel it affects you or not, if we don't get the law fixed in a way we can live with, I guarantee it will affect you sooner or later. 
And again, I've been, I've been in the trenches dealing with this issue for more than a year. I've met with countless politicians and their staff. I've met with the union. I've worked with lobbyists, PR firms, associations, and Cal Chamber. I've done extensive research and built a solid case. I can answer most questions related to the bill. Um, if you're interested in helping with the effort, and I hope you will, there's sign-in sheets. You can give us the information. And um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Debbie. I, was, I, was just, um, I wanted to say the Engineering Contractors Association is labor neutral. This is a tough place to be when you're seeing such a law come to pass to remain labor neutral. We don't take sides on labor issues one way or the other. Um, that's part of how we can toe the line and, and, and appeal to both sides and so forth. But this is a really tough one to keep our mouth shut on because this is a power grab. You said it exactly what it is. And uh, it reminds me also when the question came back over there about how is this going to get policed. It brought me back to when the fires hit. And um, I'm not in the back room uh, negotiating how this is going to get policed, but I was in the front room of these associations and the CAL FIRE and the CAL OES and all that other stuff and the Army Corps. When they talked about how they were going out there, and the unions were doing it, they were going out there on specific sites, and they were looking for everything that they could find for out-of-town truckers, truckers that didn't have the right characters <coughs> on there. Trust me on this one. This is not going to get policed by the state of California. We know who's going to be policing this, and it's not going to be very pretty. And uh, I hope we all can survive for the year or two that it will take to find a cleanup bill or something. I don't know. The other question I had was, is there any hope to get a cleanup bill written? Can you find anybody that has the cojones in Sacramento to go against the teams? Um, we, we believe that, um, we believe that we can get a cleanup bill. It's going to be, um, it's going to be real difficult, and, and as you say, um, the uh, the assembly members, and especially the assembly, because that's where it originated, and senators don't really want to go against the union. Um, but there are some that did speak up that we feel would ultimately be willing to be the authors of that legislation. That's where it starts. It's about pressure. Um, it's about continuing to talk to those people. Um, it's visiting assembly members, as you'll see, it's visiting assembly members, visiting senators, but we will have to choose authors and get them to agree to author, and we already have um, a list of some potential authors that we feel would ultimately would agree to author this, multiple authors on both sides, so that people don't have to stand up alone, and they, they actually have spoken up, and we know that they're that they said that something has to be done about trucking. Once you get the legislation agreed on, which we're working with CTA, it's, it's my team, and then it's a lobbyist that was hired by Double D that I'm also working with, and this lobbyist, we're probably gonna also, we're gonna be involved in taking him on. He's very well respected. We can never do this without a lobbyist and without CTA, okay? So it's, it's a three-way, it's grassroots, which would be us, it's this special lobbyist we have, and then it's CTA. So together, we'll be recruiting authors, and how do you get authors, and how do you get people to vote? It's pressure, it's speaking up, it's letters, it's Twitter, it's visiting the assembly, it's visiting the Senate, it's picketing. It's, it's, it's a slow, uh, you know, it's, it's not a quick thing, but there is a process, and we've been working at it, and we have made some inroads. So yes, um, there are going to be people, I believe, that are going to be willing to do that. just won't be easy. Well, thank you very much for your passion and your perseverance. This is, uh, you know, you get knocked down twice and get up three times, and that's, you, we're thankful that you're doing this for us. Appreciate it.
third speaker is a friend of mine, Mr. Mike Gelati, owner and CEO of Gelati Brothers, venerable in San Rafael, over 100 years of contracting. I can't wait to hear how you're going to do an 80 truck pave at night with this bill in place. But anyways, Mike, thank you very much for coming. late and the great thing about being last when you're speaking is that uh, less is better. So I'll make this quick. Um, I'm really here to speak about what I think is going to happen for contractors. Uh, how many contractors in the room? Fair amount. Yeah. So, um, you know, in my 35 years of full-time employment in this industry, you know, I've never seen anything like this, obviously. Um, so disruptive. But it does remind me of, you know, my grandfather when he started in 1914 and the brothers would start working for him and he'd say, you know, if you work hard and you do a good job and you treat your employees with respect, he says, someday I give you the business and they'd be happy and they'd go to bed the next day, get up and work harder and, you know, go through that. And then, as you know, we advance in society and we get more regulations and we get more restrictions and we got more compliance stuff. I remember my dad a while back and he's looking at us after some lawsuit or something and uh, he smiles and he says, remember when I told you about how your grandfather said if you work hard, I give you the business? I go, yeah. He goes, see? Now you work hard, you get the business. <laughs> So that's kind of where we're at. Um, we're, uh, we're, we're in a challenge here. Um, and, and, you know, it's going to be um, a lot of uncertainty for a long time. Um, and, and I can tell you that the three things that I think I know for sure about this, um, number one, probably everybody, whether you're a broker or your contractor, is going to get a wage in our lawsuit. Good house. And earlier, with all due respect, we were talking about how do we get away from, you know, some of these challenges? Do we do a time card? You know, do we, do we cover that, right? I can tell you by personal experience that, you know, we had a wage and hour lawsuit. Three people, all out on workers' comp. It starts there. Uh, it convinced the court to do a, 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 a class action lawsuit hired two different law firms, both on contingency, right? And, um, you know, those time cards, it says, did you take a meal, did you take a break, make sure you got your hours, all that stuff. Why was that overlooked? Even with the forms that we give them on each paycheck that says, did you get paid fairly, accurately? If you have any problems, fill it out, turn it in, we pay you. Why did all that go away? Don't speak, don't speak English, didn't know what we were signing. And number two, well, we signed it because we were afraid of retaliation. So, you can't win. All I can advise you there is hire a good lawyer and act right now as if you have a current wage and hour lawsuit pending. Have somebody come in and analyze everything you do. Because um, it's not free. One of the lawsuits after I got done was for another contractor, and they got sued because the check that they gave as a payroll check didn't have the right address of the main office. And that was a six, seven figure cell. So, you know, I think you've actually heard, um, I've heard them, I think after this just passed, in the very beginning of the year, or whenever it kind of all came to pass, was, you know, radio announcements, advertising, have you been paid for your travel time? That's what they're going after. They're going after all those. So, lawsuits out there, hire a lawyer. With all due respect, it can get pretty costly, but it's better to be prepared in advance than to wake up and have to face the music later. And then the other third thing would be um, pretty much all trucking will be prevailing wage. All trucking will be for employees. That's where they're going. I mean, that's really the reality. Um, and then comes with that is your wage and hour rules, which, you know, mean travel time, breaks, meals, all that stuff. Overtime. So you can see where all this is going. 
So, um, how will it affect, you know, the industry and our ability to perform projects? Um, there's two course, there's two, you know, there's two sides to this, right? If you work private, private work or if you work public work. Most everybody probably does a little bit of both, but maybe you focus on one or focus on the other. On, on the private work, um, I think the, the quick answer is, you know, it's going to affect both. It's going to be the availability of trucking. Um, I thought that with CARB that we were going to see a lot of people leaving the industry. And I, I don't know the numbers, but I think they probably have um, or will. Um, but now you throw this in there, and I think you're going to see a lot of people leaving the industry. Trucking, you know, is not going to have the numbers that we need. Um, and I'll talk about that more and what that does to Caltrans and SB1 and the statewide committee I sit on and, and where that's taking, you know, all the gas tax money that, I mean, how ironic is it? We finally, finally get sustainable funding in our industry for the first time and then now we got this curveball to take all that good momentum away. So, um, you know, on the, on, the, on the private side, you, you know, under 8040, I think it is, we were talking about it earlier, whatever the legislation is, it all flows out. So, you know, however, whatever layer you're hiring services or whatever, that employee is deemed an employee, <laughs> that employee is deemed an employee, that individual is <laughs> deemed an employee at some point, you are responsible for all that stuff, right? All the things that we talked about earlier. Payroll taxes, workers' comp, unemployment, uh, disability insurance, but more importantly, the, the overtime, the meal, the rest, all that stuff. So it will flow up. On the public side, you know, I said earlier, uh, prevailing wage, definitely. And this is not just, you know, and I know there's some contractors out there that think they can still get away with not paying travel time and not paying certain things, whether, you know, the material was off-site or was on-site or, you know, whatever the way you want to try to carve it out, all that's gone, you know. So I, I would advise anybody that's doing the trucking services, make sure you're getting paid. Don't, don't allow that to happen. Because if you agree to that and they pay you less than you're supposed to get and you pay somebody else less than they're supposed to get, I believe it's going to come back on you guys. So be careful. Um, so that's that's the, the you know the area I think that's going to affect us on the projects. Um, I also was going to talk about what it's going to do for a disadvantaged business enterprise, or maybe some firms in here that do that as brokers and everything. Um, if you know Public Works, and you know I've lived this probably for 15 years um, on the statewide side, I have been really protesting against where it's going on the percentage required of a contractor to hire disadvantaged business and uh, you know minority business. And the reason I have been that way is because the whole basis of the percentages of what they are requesting is ill-fated. They use this thing called the disparity study, and it's a federal requirement that analyzes how many small business and disadvantaged businesses are out there, how much work is out there, and how much is that sector getting as a percentage. Problem is they go statewide and they put these numbers together and inflate the capacity of what is really out there. And I can tell you that out of the 10,000 names that are on the database for small business, disadvantaged business, and so on, 400 do business in the state of California, statewide. It's the same 400, year after year after year. So it's this game they're playing. You know, we gotta raise percentages because of capacity. Well, if they're out there, they'd be doing business, especially right now. So I'm really upset about how they're coming out with these numbers, and right now, if you do Caltrans work, it's up to almost 20% that you gotta do disadvantaged business. Here comes SB1. On the SB1 task force, to give Caltrans credit, they decided we better get together and figure out how we're going to do all this work that's coming out, five billion a year for ten years, with the limited resources we have. We got to look at quarries. We got to look at trucking. We got to look at contracts. Look at DBE. 
how can we be more efficient, more effective? And that's part of that legislation, right, under the uh, SB1, okay? So we start looking at all that. We raise our hand about eight months ago and we go, um, you guys might want to look into this Caltrans, there's this thing called Dynamax, and it's probably going to really mess up the trucking industry. Uh, we're barely able to cover the trucking needs right now, and uh, you know if this happens, this is this is going to be devastating. So the challenge we have right now is obviously is if the brokers go away and the DVD credits go away, which I believe they will in large part, because now the bulk of the trucking that was done under the DVD broker won't be done because they're typically independent contractors. So I, I see that as being a big impact. Um, one of the other questions was, how does uh, you know the AB5 um, yeah, affect your HR department? Well, we talked about it earlier. Um, that, that's a full-time job now. So if you don't have an HR department, which most of you don't, and uh, you know, I don't encourage you to necessarily run out and get one, but you should get somebody that comes in again and looks at what you're doing and how you're doing it and helps with that. It's it's a it's a big issue. Um, the 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 wage and hour lawsuit we talked about, the contingencies, the time card we talked about. Where's the future? So I I don't know how brokers survive right now with where the legislation is. Um, you know, in and of itself, I think I think right now. Uh, everybody's an employee <laughs> until we figure out something else. Um, and I don't know if anybody wants to be the guinea pig and try some kind of creative way of carving out, uh, given what we know about wage and hour lawsuits. Um, so I think that's, that's really going to be a challenge. Uh, lack of trucks um, in the trucking industry. You know, the problem I think that really uh, came through the most in all this legislative and lobbying and all that is clearly that Sacramento has no idea what goes on with construction trucking. They really have no idea. You know, they think that every day we start the day with 10 trucks and tomorrow we need 10 trucks and the next day we need 10 trucks and every contractor is the same and every truck is the same and they just don't get it, right? I mean, Okay, Brand X needs 25 trucks to pay for three weeks, then they may or may not need any. And then company Y needs 25, and those may overlap. I mean, we're all in here, we know the business. Clearly, they do not know the business. They don't know the dynamics of our industry. And that's why this current model works and has served the industry uh, because of those dynamics. And now we're going to upset them. Uh, the DBE uh, industry, the percentages, I think that's all going to go away. Uh, for the, uh, not go away, I mean, it's going to be just incredibly challenging. You know, the majority of the dollars that um, satisfy those DBE requirements in Caltrans work, and even in on the local city and county, 60 something percent of it is through trucking. So, that's going to be a hard number to make up. Ultimately, if things don't turn around and they don't, and we don't figure this out, I could see a model where trucking uh, is done by the material supplier. I could see a model where suppliers and materials start doing their own trucking, and that would be problematic for a lot of reasons too. Um, so hopefully it doesn't get there. So, um, you know, in general, as far as contractors and how does it affect us, um, first of all, it affects us as uh, the potential uh, wage and hour for the uh, employee issue. Um, I think we're going to have to be very, very careful because even if we hire somebody that is doing stuff they think is right, again, AB40 flows through, and ultimately, if there is a problem, and they don't have the deep pockets or whatever, it will come back on us. You've got to be very careful. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, I, I really believe that uh, if you're in business, you know, um, go do some research and make sure that we know 
uh, that you know what you're what you're doing HR wise and employee wise and all your forms and all that. Even if you're not necessarily directly in this funnel right now that we're talking about, it's a good exercise and money well spent. So, um, you know, we're we're going to all work together. I mean, certainly the the construction industry cannot stomach this kind of impact of the trucking industry. So we are supportive of this uh, effort that Debbie's talking about, and uh, we're, we're all in it together because um, right now this is not a, a viable solution. So in the, in the interim, God bless and good luck. <laughs> you're right that they don't understand the industry and the business because maybe with Debbie and others help they could be educated about the problems they're causing. My bigger fear is the special interests who own the legislature do understand the business and just don't like it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's my bigger fear. Yeah. All right. my, my only comment too is Kimber and I went and Tried to speak to Bill Dodd. I, I actually spoke to Dodd at the Sonoma County Alliance breakfast and called him out in front of 200 people and I said, hey, are you going to do something to carve out for our trucking industry? And he didn't want to hear that at all. We went and talked to Logan Pitts at Dodd's office. He didn't want to hear it at all. He says it's too complicated. And so I hope you're right, Keith, and I hope you're right that we can get through to him. But there was zero appetite prior to this thing getting uh, pushed through and signed by, by Newsom. There was 12 people that stood up, if, if I remember the news reports correctly, on either the assembly floor or the Senate floor. They were all Republicans. And if you're a Republican in the state of California in Sacramento, who cares? So they stood up. They fought a little bit for the trucking industry for the car out, And they got zippity doo up. So I don't know what's going to happen. If, let me, let me just say one thing quickly because we're going to have a couple of wrap up questions, I'm sure. Don has filled this whole thing. So there's a lot of information that got transmitted here. If you want to get uh, this video, it will be on our website, www.nceca.org, in 24 hours, 48 hours? Yes, 24. 24 hours. The other thing I wanted to say before we kind of wrap this up too is both Keith and the NCBE and the ECA, we, we work really well together. They pretty much handle everything above the ground. We pretty much handle things below the ground. There's strength in numbers. You can't see a better example of why we should be banded together and why alliances between the North Coast Builders Exchange and the ECA and the trucking industry are so important these days because nobody can fight this by themselves. So if you're interested in finding out some information on how to join, uh, Mary's back there, wave your hand, beautiful Mary Kennedy Cabrera, and uh, she will uh, give you whatever you need to know to join the ECA. Yeah, we have a waiting list to get in, John, so <laughs> thank you. When, when I was president of the Builders Exchange, we had 1,830 members. How many do you have now? Uh, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, I want to thank our three speakers. It's five minutes till. We do have time for questions, but let's give them a huge round of applause. And so last second questions. We got five minutes here. Yes, sir. Quick question for you. Uh, wondering about uh, how does it work with state lines and the federal lines, such as if you're a California-based company, if the person is in California, regardless if it's Borello or AB5, they'd be an employee. What happens if they permanent residence is in Arizona? Would you still classify them as an employee of the, Santa, uh, the company in California, or would you be able to classify them as a contractor? If they're working in California. If they're working in California, then they're going to be so they're going to have the protections of the laws in California for workers. So the fact that they live in Arizona, it can create some fun games for attorneys with regard to jurisdiction and venue. 
but they'll have the protections of the California if they're performing services in California. The whole issue of preemption, and Debbie mentioned the CTA case dealing with pre preemption, that's going to be on the basis of interstate transportation versus intrastate transportation. So it's more likely, and we got some good news uh, on the front of interstate. I know that's confusing. Inter, intra, why do we make things again complicated? Um, but if you're crossing the state lines, you are in a much better position than if you're delivering or driving your truck and staying within the state of California. Now, and most everybody in here is construction, construction related, as opposed to moving. Yeah. So unless you've got materials that are flowing across straight line and then you're just continuing the transportation of those materials, you're not likely going to be interstate and not likely going to get the protection of federal law and preemption. So if the stuff was batched here in California and you're picking it up and delivering it in California, that's intrastate and you're not going to get the protections of federal law. And then the follow-up question on that. Um, now, how does it work? Is I'm a I'm on the design side. I'm not a trucker or a contractor. So if I let's say I retain a foreign nationalist that's not doesn't have citizenship in the United States, that's performing work in their country, I imagine that everything's off the table. Yeah, you got no problems with that. Just don't ever let them come to California. <laughs> now, you were saying federal protected federal law. If I hold one load. And I had a DOT number, will that be everything is protected under the federal law or is it just what you're doing at that day? A lot more complicated than that, but you would not be able to hook federal protection by driving one load across state line and saying, oh, I'm good to go. I think you guys are probably all thinking the same as I am that for once in our lives we're going to be writing more letters to our assembly men and women so forth. I, I want to hit on one thing that probably is a little vulnerable vein to them. Uh, here two years ago we had some fires and we had some fire cleanup. The one thing, Kimber, that Logan Pitts told us when we went and talked to him, it was a very good point, was we asked him, who the hell do you think is going to clean up the two million tons worth of debris when the next fires hit? There are not going to be any local truckers. They're all going to be coming from Utah, Texas, Arizona, and other states. And he said that was a really good point. So you might want to weep that into your letters and just explain that if you dry up the local economy and there's no truckers to handle the debris haul off for the next earthquake, flood, fire, all the money doesn't stay here anymore. It's going to have a huge effect on the economy for all those that went and did fire cleanup. We know how much we got paid. We know how we didn't take advantage of it, but it was very good for us in the winter time. So, Kimber, yes. The only things that he really cared about is show me data and what about me. All he all he cared about was how this is going to affect any other individual, and so. If you decide not to use a form letter, if you decide to add some more information of your own, uh, that would be really quality to put in there. For example, he was saying, how is it going to cause a delay on a highway repair? For example, um, how many days or how many trucks would you be short if you couldn't do what you do He now? wanted specifics. He wanted, yeah, he wanted that. Yeah. And, and I will say, too, that our board of directors at the ECA kind of turned turned me loose on this too, so I feel kind of liberated that I can do something on the state level because we usually don't deal with stuff on the state level, so um, we can energize whatever resources we have to write letters, talk to the local officials, the local electives, and exert whatever pressure we can exert. So, yeah, Keith. And John, we were happy to provide the venue, but I want everybody to know this is an ECA and John Bly show with a lot of help from Mary Kennedy, so they deserve a hearty round of applause. Okay. 
for Canada. Um, I provided a handout, which I hope every contractor here will take that handout with them. There's a few on each table. Um, if not, I mean, look around on the tables. It says how a contractor can help. Very simply, um, the best way they can help right now would be to make an appointment with their own assembly member and their own senator for every address that they have. Let me come along to that appointment to address uh, some technical issues. That contractor can stand up for brokers and explain the importance, explain a lot of things that Mike was talking about, et cetera. I can give the technical information. We have another uh, trucker, have another trucking company that's also um, a constituent, have an owner operator in there, a meeting where that they would instigate. That's what we need from contractors is for them to instigate a meeting with any and every assembly member or senator in their district and anyone that they know for any other reason. Instigate the meeting with them, not their staff invite us and put the point across because that's something that hasn't happened yet it will make a difference we've planted the seed for a lot of this i wanted to say just very quickly um there were people who stood up there were several assembly members that stood up there were several senators that stood up all democrats um they, there were adam gray a democrat actually voted against ab5 the answer was, hey, we can't vote against AB5 because otherwise everyone would lose their exemption. But you had several people that stood up and spoke, and that's considered to be a very, um, that's a, a very good achievement. And those particular people that stood up are the ones that we're going to be uh, tapping. And I wanted to mention about the material supplier broker. There's nothing in there that says that a material supplier is allowed to broker trucks. Um, he'd be acting as a broker, so I don't see anything in there at all that says he's allowed to do that. Uh, as far as preemption, real quick, that lawsuit would solve would solve everything, but you know we can't count on the lawsuit. You were talking about the uh, the other operators of labor union kind of standing back and letting. Matter of fact, construction industry gets all disrupted. It's going to affect the operators and the laborers too. They're going to be out of work also. So it's kind of a dumb position to take on their behalf. Couldn't agree with you more. As a very small token of our appreciation, first of all, let's ask can you guys stay for just a couple more minutes? Because we obviously have a couple more questions. But, um, this is wine country. So we wanted to give you some uh, good Sonoma County vino. That uh, as a token of our appreciation, we are a nonprofit, so this is better than the warm applause that we usually give our speakers. <laughs> and uh, we have a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> How do they think the grapes get to the wineries? <laughs> you know, uh, anybody here from the Farm Bureau? Oh, hi. Good to see you back there, buddy. Thank you for coming, because this does affect you guys as well. You don't, you didn't get a car out, did you? I think we talked a little bit about harvest time when the real crunch is on. Uh, a lot of those harvesters do own their own rigs, their employees, so they're not farming that out to some haulers. So there's some insulation there, but this is going to affect the farm, farming industry in a huge manner. Yeah. There's a lot of brokers that also broker out truck haul rigs. They say there is almost 80,000 auto operators in California. What's happening January 1st? I park my car. Can anybody answer that? Because I have to start the licensing, the insurance, and everything. Should I do it or just park it? You should do it. You should do it. Exactly. And you should get ready to get reimbursed for it somehow if you're an employee. But how that's going to work into the system, I don't think. Thank you. I'm also going to throw something else out because th this might entail a follow-up forum. I just, I just, did, 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 do you guys think in about a month to five, five or six weeks, it might be beneficial for us to do this one more time and see exactly what's transpired? If there's interest in that, the cards are back there. Send me an email, give me a thumbs up, and we'll organize it one more time.
Anybody say yeah? Yes. 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 Anybody say no? The, the reason I also say that about going ahead and getting registered and, and moving forward January 1st is the only thing that's going to be beneficial out of this is the trucking industry has over time depressed the wages of the drivers. And that hasn't been a good thing. So whether we like it or not as an industry, we're in an industry right now where the money is there, it's sustainable, um, drivers should get paid what they need to get paid. And so I believe that you're going to see a range, you know, you're going to see a range of uh, uh, rates that are, you know, somewhere between 50, 75 percent more um, on top of what I'm going to try to hold those very good people on several more so the first thing I think everybody should do is get opinion from several sit down private meetings with several lawyers Levine, 
Woods, McGuire, yes. Cecilia over in Solana County. And we have a little heart to heart. And then maybe we follow up that with another group, with the whole group. What about having them here at this potential meeting? We gotta get them there. But I think we could, if we have the GCs on board, that's a lot of pressure, and that's a lot of employees, and, and we got a lot of leverage. Yeah. And John, if they send any fundraising letters to you, keep all this in mind. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, if they want, they're running, you know, many of them are running for office. <laughs> you know, I keep getting them, and I, I, I get so pissed off when I get those right now. You, you know, because the last newsletter I wrote, not very favorable to them. Anyways, any last second questions here? Yes, sir. Mark, if you go in the yeah, I mean, for everybody that knows prevailing wage, typically it's, it's what the, um, you know, the prevailing wage is based on surveys in the, in the past of what is the, the main wages that are out there. And because we are in the Bay Area, it defaults to the Teamsters rate. It defaults to... It's, it's, it, when they say prevailing wage, it's the same for Caltrans, the city, the counties, whatever. It is basically the Teamsters rate. So, Is it more than it's what? Twenty-eight bucks an hour if you're working. If you're importing or exporting in the counties where we're from, then it's only twenty-eight bucks an hour. But but I know some other counties, some that you guys work in, Solano and a few others, it defaults as you said. You have to check the schedule. <laughs> Oh yeah, in those counties like Solano and all of that. Well, again, it's that's the employee prevailing wage. It's like sixty bucks an hour in certain counties right now. For all, for all in Solano and in certain counties like Solano and some others that we we never work in those counties. It's sixty bucks an hour, no matter what you do, sixty and change, and we're about where we are. Is that in this county that it is? Well, right. I, and that's true, there's a lot of criteria on the GIR, it says statewide, countywide. So there's five counties that automatically go home to teach their rate. But even in doing that, there's on site, right, which defaults you to a truck driver, which is a dump truck driver, which is a lower wage. And then there's uh, export, which takes you to a higher rate. So you still got to be real careful on creating wage. It's not, it's not cut and dry. It's by schedule, you have to pull out the schedules. Okay, all right. I just want to share something. You guys are talking about a wage, uh, you know, for lunch and meal break. I have a buddy of mine. Had all the time truck sign on half the camp where he's got the best box in the world. He's going to carry about all of them, two of them like that. That's just going to Yeah, but ended up getting 92,000 a piece. Plus, it said, plus all his attorney fees, he could probably enter almost. Many of us have been there. Anyways, thank you, Stephen Holden, Debbie Flores, and Mike Gelati. Thank you, guys.